as you will learn from him today. And I saw everyone coming up and, and talking cameos and sharing the pieces that you brought. That has been really fun. So I'm really liking the show and tell element of our tea today. Um, and our, our speaker, Ron, and his collecting of these cameos actually started with a Christmas wish made by his daughter. She really wanted a cameo one year for Christmas. Um, and then that has been a, a hobby and a passion that kind of united them um, and resulted in a part of a beautiful collection uh, that you'll see here today. Please help me welcome Ron Hines. Good afternoon. We got a wonderful day for this, don't we? Uh, she said, it's something my daughter wanted, and she and I have spent a lot of time online and walking around looking for things of this nature. And one of the first things we had to learn was, what is a cameo? There is a lot of argument over this. I go by the strict definition. A cameo is a surface that has a raised figure on it. There are those that have figures incised into the surfaces, those that we consider intaglios. They are not what we would call a true cameo. Uh, what is the materials used? A lot of people have been fascinated by the one I have on my lapel. This is made out of coral. Most of you that I've, or actually all of you that I've seen so far have brought in either resin cameos or they brought in cameos made out of shell. And they use a multitude of shell. Uh, the collection over here has carnelian shale, sarcoxy shale. I unfortunately didn't bring any mother of pearl with me. Um, there's pink shell. You'll see some that have, there was one over here quite beautiful. It has a white background with a pink figure on it that is not dyed that way. That is simply by carving away different layers. They also use lava. There's some examples of lava. All the lava is collected around Vesuvius. And it generally, once again, touches the cameos. It comes quite thick, so they can generally get some beautifully sculptured detail on the lava cameos. We don't know a lot about them. It's one of the few that I don't clean. <laughs> I just leave it alone and hope that nothing happens to it. Hard shell, the, or I'm sorry, hard stone is a, um, a banded agate that as the chemicals were laid down, they were laid down in layers. And what they've done is they've mined that, and then they cut down and expose the different layers to do the different things. The ones I have here, there's only one that has three layers on it. I've seen up to four or five layers, beautifully done. Normally, they're just two layers, the main figure and the colored background. Uh, tiger eye, I don't believe I have any tiger eye over here. I do have some Whitby Jet. Whitby Jet is a fossilized coal. It is black. It was most commonly used during the Victorian time for what was called mourning jewelry because it can be polished to a very bright, shiny figure. Uh, and then, uh, so I was talking to someone earlier, not all black jewelry is mourning jewelry. As if anything, when it becomes fashionable, people start wearing it simply to wear it, not necessarily for mourning. There are a few pieces in here that are old, what we call old resin. Uh, you've probably heard of the old films being done in celluloid. There are some celluloid cameos over here. On the outside edges of the collection, you'll find some that are done in bakelite and vulcanite. You're probably most familiar with bakelite in some of your older um, silverware sets. They came as the handles, or maybe your mother or grandmother had it as a set for uh, powders. She may have had the little container with the hole in it to put hair in, things of that nature. So it, it, it's available. One lady asked, Where, are there any blue ones? And I said, well, yeah, but I didn't bring my blue one. Blue one's Wedgwood. And I simply collected it. Many of the pieces I collect, not because I particularly care for them, but I collect them because by touching them and examining them and looking at them closely, I can learn so much from the piece. So a lot of the collection for me is not necessarily for its beauty, but it's to extend my knowledge on the subject. And I don't consider myself an expert. You know, I'm, a, I'm an amateur. So if I make a mistake up here, don't hesitate to point it out. Because like I said, I want to learn from you too. OK? Uh, the period that I personally collect in is the Victorian, 
the Edwardian into the early 1940s. So I'm looking at 1830s to 1940s is the primary focus of this collection right here. We do know from, and these, these are the books, the texts that I've been using all along, that there were cameos being produced by the Greeks and by the Romans. I've never seen one in person, I've only seen them here, but we do know they existed back then. But when they discovered, and those are all definitely done in hard stone, they didn't start using shell until later, and when they discovered they could use shell, well, they, it blossomed. They really started producing a lot. How are they made? Most of the old ones are made by carving. They actually have tools that they will set there and carve it out. So they will get the shell and they'll have someone who specializes in this. He will carve or cut out the blanks. They will then we use wax. They will mount that onto a post and on that onto a stem. And that is what the carver will use. He'll put it in different positions. He'll bolt it in different ways. He'll take very fine tools and he'll sit there and gradually carve away at it. On average, they say most cameos can take anywhere from a few weeks to a few months to produce. Germany is producing hardstone cameos. They're using a technique now called ultrasound or ultrasonic. They are actually, they will, someone will carve an honest one and then they will use that as a blank to start producing these others with their ultrasonic machines. They're nice, but obviously they can produce quite a lot of them. They can produce cameos in hours or days, what would take weeks or months normally. So their value is not quite what you would expect from a hand-carved cameo. You can detect them fairly easily if you were to get a magnifying glass or a jeweler's loop. If you look very closely at them, they have what's called the snowflake effect. The surface is not polished smooth, and there are no defined lines. If you look at your cameos, there are defined lines, very sharp lines. The ultrasonics don't have those. They can't produce those in that. So they're a slightly different bird. I haven't gotten into collecting those. They're just not within the time frame that I want. The bulk of this collection is from, was probably produced for what was called the Grand Tour. And in the mid 1700s up to the Napoleonic Wars, it was part of a young man's, aristocrat young man, aristocratic young man, it was part of his final education to go on the Grand Tour. And this was a tour that took approximately three years out of his life. And he would start at home and he would travel to the continent, and these are mostly Englishmen, Travel to the continent, they would do France, Spain, Germany, down into Italy, probably across over into the Greek islands, but they were gone for three years. Well, being the typical tourist, they collected souvenirs, and they would collect these cameos either mounted or unmounted as souvenirs for um, a betrothed mother, aunt, grandmother, and bring them and present them to them. The Victorians claimed to be an enlightened group, but there were very few women that went on the grand tour. And only women that ever really went were divorced or were separated from their husband. Because obviously no upright Victorian man was going to deal with his wife tromping across the European continent for three years without him in suit. <laughs> Subject matter on these things, a lot of it, we, most of us think of them as female figures, usually a bust. That was mainly done for the Grand Tour. Prior to that, if you look at some of these uh, uh, plaster sculptures we have here, they did famous paintings. They did Greek gods, Roman gods. Um, some of the older ones are really hard to identify until you get into your art books and you start, oh, there's the picture. I believe I got one over here that is uh, uh, Samuel proclaiming to Eli that God called him. Uh, there, that, and I have the specific, I have located the specific painting that one's off of. 
I have another one here that's called The Hunter Returns. Again, I have found the specific painting that that one came from. So we, for me, part of the joy is when I get a new piece is to research that piece, to identify the person. Once I've identified the person, then I obviously I'm also trying to identify what's it made out of and how old is it. And there are many clues we use to date these things. Most of the ones done in the Victorian, early Edwardian period had what was called the Roman nose. The Roman nose literally went straight from the forehead down to the tip. There is no gap like we have in our noses here. No gaps. So if we see the Roman nose, we start to think, oh, this may be Victorian Edwardian. The old, the newer ones, they have what's called the Barbie nose. It flips up and it's very pointed and there's a definite dip into it. So some of you had some resin cameos. I, I identified them as a girl with ponytail. If you look closely at them, her nose tends to be a little upright and pointed. We look at the hairstyle. Uh, in, if we're looking at 20s, 30s, we're into the, that um, flapper stage. The women's hair went up. It was cut shorter, it was more bobbed. Whereas in the Victorian periods, they tend to be longer. They fell down on their shoulders. We look to see if there's any jewelry. Uh, the flapper period, there was usually a lot of jewelry. There was earrings and whatnot. The early Victorian period had no jewelry on it as a general rule. It wasn't until the late Victorian, early Edwardian that we started to notice the, the inclusion of a necklace. So this will help us identify, if we feel it's Edwardian, it'll help us identify where in the Edwardian period this one might have come from. If they're mounted, there's a big clue there as to how old these are. You'll notice that most of mine are not mounted. I can't afford mounted cameos. They're just out of my budget. So I have to train to look for visual clues. But if they're mounted, what do you mean mounted? Mounted into the, what holds them, the gold or silver that's, um, if you turn them over, and uh, several people notice I asked if I could touch them, if I could hold them, because what I wanted to do is turn them over and look at the clasp and the hinge in the early, and, and then the pin. In the early ones, they had a C-clasp. It was like this, and then the pin just went up inside of it. The locking C-clasp, where it actually had something, was patented around 1911, as I recall. That would have a little lever that would lock this in place. So immediately we can start looking at them and saying, oh, it has a non-locking C-class or a locking C-class. That'll help us state them also. The hinge on a, on a Victorian tends to be long and narrow with the pin coming out of it. The modern hinges that we're used to, the ball and pin hinges, were usually again developed sometime in the 1920s, 1930s. So this will help us also. The length of the pen, if you notice, or if you have an old, old Victorian pen, the pen will actually stick out beyond the edge of the mounting. Whereas as they got newer and newer, that got shorter and shorter to where at the end of the Victorian early Edwardian, they were completely hidden behind the pen it's the, or the mounting itself. Mounting material really doesn't tell us much. It can be gold, it could be silver. They used uh, a lot of, uh, and it's, um, use of gold and silver was not the common materials that they used. They used a product called Pinchback. It was an amalgamy of different kinds of metals, relatively inexpensive, that they would mount theirs into. Most of these, unfortunately, were probably mounted in gold and silver, and that's why they're no longer mounted. I can find on several of these damage where they've ripped the mounting off to sell. So it, uh, it's unfortunate, but at least it gave me the opportunity to be the custodian of these until I pass them on to my daughter. Uh, and that's what I consider myself. I'm a custodian. I'm simply saving these for the next generation. And hopefully my daughter will think the same way. Um, I have learned a lot out of books. And these are the books that I've been using 
and you're more than welcome to come up later and take a look at them. They helped me help, uh, establish a pricing method. They helped me start learning how the mountings were created. They show different styles that I have not purchased yet, but I've found online, and they make me very excited to try to buy them. I also use two websites, and these websites have taught me more about cameos than the other two websites. The first one's called cameoheaven.com, and that's all one word. The other one's called antiquecameos.net. They're beautiful. These, I rank cameos by poor, fair, good museum quality. Most of these are either good, there's a few museum quality in here. Most of the cameos that these people sell, and this is their, one of their hobbies in it at the very least, are good to unbelievable museum quality. They show beautiful pictures, they have great descriptions. If you're interested in learning more about cameos, I would strongly encourage you to look at these two websites. The Cameo Heaven one, the only thing I would caution, I don't believe she had a good or strong Christian upbringing, and she makes a lot of mistakes with her Christian cameos. She misidentifies them. But other than that, they're usually spot on, very accurate with their identification, age, and their pictures, like I say, are just, just magnificent. All right, now let's talk how do we wear them? How do we store them? How do we clean them? Cameos, the worst things for cameos is heat, ultraviolet light, and sudden temperature change. So you want to store them in a stable environment where they are not in a direct line of sunlight. You do not want to put them up in the attic, which unfortunately that's where some of mine came from, was people who stored them up in the attic and found it that that's where great grandma put them a long time ago. You want to store them in uh, some place, you do not want to store them in plastic. You want to store them in something that they can breathe. They have to have room around them, they got to breathe. Uh, what I use are flocked trays, but uh, if you have a nice jewelry box, those generally have a, a nice background that these can sit on. You do not want to store multiple pieces of jewelry together because if they get knocked together, almost all this material is very easily scratched and you will damage your cameo. You've got to keep them separated. Cleaning is a personal preference. I like to clean my cameos to back to the condition they were when they were first created. Some people like them a little dirty so that they have a vintage look to them. And either way is correct, which, which, whichever you prefer. A lot of the ones I get though have been stored for God only knows how long, under what conditions. Some of them come to me, they're, they're almost brown. So I clean everything I have. What do I use to clean? I use toothpaste, the absolute cheapest toothpaste I can find on the market. I generally go to the dollar store. It has to be white. We don't want any dyes in the toothpaste. No baking soda, no stars, just plain, simple, put it in your hand. If you feel any grit, it's not to be used. If it's a nice, creamy toothpaste, fantastic. So I simply squirt some of this out on my countertop. I wet the Cameo down, and you use water as close to the temperature of the Cameo as you can, because you do not want to shock the Cameo. Just pick some of it up, and you just gently start cleaning the Cameo. You should never work your Cameos more than about 10, 15 minutes tops. We don't want them to get saturated with water. Then you will rinse them perfectly clean, and the, the toothpaste does an excellent job on the silver and gold too. Rinse them perfectly clean, and then set them aside on a piece of cloth, and let them dry thoroughly. That'll probably take a couple hours. If, like most of I got, have probably never been conditioned in decades. So the next thing I will do is I will take it, and I will submerge the cameo in mineral oil 
for at least 24 hours. The old text, really old text, say to use olive oil. But I tried that, and the text warned against it. If you don't get the olive oil out, particularly on the mounted ones when it gets into the crevices, it will, it will sour, and the cameos will take on an odor. The olive oil, you know, I, I never use, other than the first time I experimented, I don't like olive oil. So mineral oil, use mineral oil, just plain, ordinary mineral oil. If you're not active, yes, ma'am. You're doing this with all your pieces? I'm doing it with all my shell, shell. my coral. Um, I'm doing it with the Bakelite, the Vulcanite. I do not do it with the lava because, as I said, I can find no texts, no references on how to clean the lava. So right now, I rinse it under water. I slightly take any debris off that I can. I dry it and I store it. Do you ever find ivory cameos? I wish. <laughs> um, they're available on the market, but uh, particularly with Obama's ban on ivory, you have to have so much documentation on it to, if you're going to keep it, but eventually pass it on to your heirs, you have to prove that this is pre-banned ivory. It's just not worth the hassle. If it's not done properly, the government could come in and seize it. So, or they could cause your, your, rel your, your the people you pass them on to, it caused them problems too, if they were to ever try to sell it. So I'd love to own a piece. The closest I can get in here is a piece that's made out of celluloid. It's called Ivertine. It was developed by the French I believe around 1901, and it is, a, it is a resin, and as they extruded it, it extruded into lines that look like ivory. That's the closest I've gotten so far. Yes, ma'am. After you soaked it in the mineral oil, do you rinse it or just No, it? after you soak it in the mineral oil, you'll lift it out and you will dry it thoroughly with cloth. Never, ever, ever use paper of any manner, type, or form. So you dry it with cloth. Your goal is to remove every molecule of that mineral oil off of there that you can, and you won't get it all. It will have a nice sheen to it. You'll probably feel it, and you'll know there's mineral oil on there, but get it off as best as you can. Is there a certain type of cloth that you use for this? I use my washcloths. Because I like the, 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 they have the little, um, uh, yeah, they have a tooth to it that makes it real handy to get down into all the cracks and crevices. And then if you're actively wearing it, or if you're uh, anal like me, I moisturize these twice a year with mineral oil. If you're actively wearing your cameos, I would strongly suggest you moisturize them at least twice a year. You don't have to go through this total submersion. When I, what I use right now as a shortcut, because I'm dealing with over 400 pieces between mine and the other collections I work with, I send, are you ever familiar with the dry brush technique when you paint? Okay, I use the dry brush technique. I'll put a little mineral oil on my hand and then I will lightly go like this with this brush just to get a little bit on it. I'll then take a piece of paper, I'll wipe as much of it off as I can, and then I will paint my cameos with what mineral oils left on here, front and back. Um, it's a lot simpler than dunking it all in mineral oil and then trying to clean several hundred cameos at one time. This is also, and for those of you who don't have one of these, um, and most of the people in this room would not be using one of these. Um, a, a cheap makeup brush that has not been used because most makeup has grit in it. So we would not want that on the brush. Uh, I, I played around. I get buy cameos in lots and most of it is not of the quality I want. So I experiment on it. What happens if I do this? What happens if I do that? And I tried some of my daughter's makeup brushes. She's a model. She has, she throws them away constantly. 
tried to wash it out. I just wasn't satisfied with what I was seeing. It just didn't give me, I was not comfortable with it. I was still afraid there was still something in there. This has only had shaving cream in it, so I wasn't worried about this. But uh, that I find that dry brush technique works really well. All of these were conditioned just before I brought them here. I simply went through. It also does a very nice job, particularly storming the flock like I do. The flock has a tendency through electrostatic, uh, the electric, they draw the flock off so they're covered with little particles. So before someone would want to wear something like that, I would just take something like this and just lightly brush it off. When you wear it, again, you don't want to be out in the sunlight with it. So this is not a summer piece of jewelry that you're going out on a picnic. This is a morning, evening piece of jewelry. Wear it to church. Wear it to the, uh, a show, to a movie, something like that. Be very careful that it doesn't bump up against something because they will crack, they will shatter. If it is cold outside, make sure it is inside your coat so that it doesn't get that sudden thermal shock. It will, they will develop cracks. And some of you may have noticed I walked up to the window with your piece and looked. Um, this young lady over here had a beautiful landscape, walked up to see if it had cracks in it because it's not unusual. There are cracks and then there are, there are stress cracks. Stress cracks are not bad. The actual crack itself where you can see it both on the front and the back devalues them very, very much. It also makes them unstable and they're more likely to fall apart if, you, if you're not careful with them. Uh, so again, stay out of the light, watch the thermal inversion on them. When you bring them home after you take them off, take a light brush and dust them lightly. Because as you know, dust eats into anything it sets on for a long period of time. So you want to keep them as clean as possible. And because they might have that light sheen of oil on them, they will have a tendency to get that dust on them. So any light cleaning will help that also. Um, cleaning, storage, I think we just about covered it all. Yeah, I was gonna say, questions? Well, um, quality of the carving would be the first thing that would determine what it is or how much it's worth. The material it's carved on would also dictate that. And then the subject matter would also dictate that. Um, this particular piece I'm wearing right now is coral. The subject matter is Hermes. Is a very popular subject in the in this group. Um, it's mounted in ten karat gold. I'm putting a conservative retail value on it between seven and nine hundred dollars. Most of the cameos I have in here, had they been mounted in pinchback, at this time I would probably value between seventy-five and one hundred twenty-five dollars per each. I have some museum quality ones. I have a museum quality one there. It's the finest carved one I have. Unfortunately, it's got a break. It was, it was mishandled. But the quality of the carving is such, even broken, I'm valuing it at $100, simply because it is so beautifully carved. Lava rock um, is like the coral. You get a lot of depth to the lava rock. So a lot of people migrate more towards those types of pieces. Personally, I don't. I don't like the lava. I collect it simply because I want to, again, hold it, touch it, study it. So I know when I'm online and I'm looking at a piece, I know what I'm looking at. Uh, most people gravitate naturally towards the shells. And they have been produced in such large quantities that Sometimes, yes, they don't have a lot of value to them. But again, that's going to fall back on the quality. So if you look at these cameos here, you'll, you'll probably see a distinct difference between what you're looking at here and what you may be looking at 
in a retail store. Totally different appearance. There's some of them here that are just miniature sculptures. They are absolutely magnificent. Yes, I am obsessing again. You have to forgive me. Um, if you are trying to buy one, if, they won't, you, if you don't bring one with you, then hopefully they will let you take it up. But you need to take the cameo and shine towards the back of it and look for stress cracks. Look for cracks. This will identify those very rapidly. If you're buying from a reputable company online, they will always show you the back of the cameo. And if they're really reputable, they will show you with the light shining through it. So you want to look at those. The big problem you're going to have until you learn it is to tell the difference between an honest to goodness, totally separated crack and a tension crack. Because once they separate these from the cameos and the shells are old, they expand, they contract, they're going to get internal cracks in them. Uh, her cameo was, had no cracks in it. It was perfect. <clears throat> I would say only about 30% of those cameos over there have no cracks in them. Yes, sir. The, as, I, as I was mentioning earlier, we do know that they were produced by the Greeks and the Romans, but I've never seen one. I'll take this lady first. Yes, ma'am. I guess I shouldn't say that word again. <laughs> the small ones, I would not necessarily say are going to be more valuable. It's, it's all going to fall back on the quality and the quality of the carving. And most of them would work, a minimum size would be about like so. Those are ones that I see the highest quality on. Another thing that makes them, and I, forgot, I should have mentioned this earlier, another thing that makes them valuable is this one, if, I, if I'm looking at it, this one's a left-facing cameo carved by a right-handed person. That's more difficult than carving a right-facing cameo if you're a right-handed person. So the direction the face is looking also increases the value. But it's really the quality of the carving, the subject matter, and the material it's made out of. Those are your three primary factors. And then, of course, what it's mounted in. Yes, ma'am. Do you ever go to estate sales or antique shows, or do you mostly do all of your I, uh, I go to, down into uh, Royal Oak, <coughs> to that flea market, at least twice a, a week. I mean, I'm, uh, twice a month. Most of what's there I wouldn't have. And what they, I would have is they've priced totally out of the market. I have gone to flea markets. My daughter and I used to love. She's grown up with a boyfriend and out of the house. Daddy sees her maybe once a month. Yes, I'm an empty nester. Please feel sorry for me. But um, when she was still with me, we would hit flea markets, garage sales, open houses, anything we could hit. As a general rule, I didn't find much, not much at all. Almost everything I get, I get online, online auctions, and surprisingly enough, eBay, as long as you know what you're looking at. One of the biggest, um, I'd say, misinformed, would probably be better, misinformed cameos that I've seen on, online are the coral ones. They oftentimes call them coral, but they're referencing to the color, not to the material. And then there's a type of coral called pink shell, I'm sorry, angel skin. And it should be a uniform pink color. There is a pink shell cameo over here, and they frequently identify the pink shell as coral. So they're charging a coral price for a shell cameo. So there's you really have to be careful. There's, there's a plastic one in here I can show to people. I have only been fooled twice so far on an online purchase. I thought it was shell. It was plastic. It's a very good plastic. <laughs> it 
just to, just to buoy my spirits up a little bit, but uh, it was definitely plastic. Oh, we, there's just a several of us that have collections, and we share. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I had a chance to look over somebody's shoulder, and I had my glasses on. But do you have a cameo that is um, the Coliseum? Yes. It's done in, um, it's done in, uh, it's a tiger, tiger, tiger conch. Yeah. It's, that's a more modern souvenir. Uh, it's one of the few I'll tolerate. That one was probably done sometime in the 30s or 40s. But it's definitely a souvenir. There's probably two of them over there. I believe there's one that's a sailboat and one that is the Roman Colosseum. It's a cheap metal mounting, but uh, you just don't see a lot. Yeah, some of them are better than others. I, I tried to, I just picked up a couple I thought were pretty decent looking. And again, it's not necessarily I wanted them for their value. I wanted them to hold them, to touch them, to analyze them, to look how that frame was built. So if I look at others in the future, I know, oh, this is a cheaper one, and this is a higher quality one. Thank you. Yes, sir. Two questions. Yes, sir. When were cameos most popular? What part of history were people you know, looking for them and buying them? And how did you buy it? Did you go to jewelry stores? Did you go to Jail Hudson's? Did you? Most of my. eBay back then. So what, how did they, uh, Well, as I had mentioned earlier, the Grand Tour is when uh, a lot of the cameos we see here were picked up because they were um, the souvenirs. Napoleon actually promoted the cameo and brought it back into fashion more so than maybe the late Victorian, early Edwardian did. He actually had them in his crown and his wife was an avid collector and I believe she had them sewn into her wedding dress. Don't quote me on that, but I, I thought I read something to that effect. So it kind of fluctuated between popularity with monarchs. If the monarch liked it, then people liked it. It's kind of like the bit mourning jewelry that Victoria wear, wore. Uh, everyone started wearing it. Napoleon liked cameos. Oh, well, then we should all have cameos. So it, it, it comes and goes. When I first started, and that was only about seven, eight years ago, cameos were relatively inexpensive. I could pick up pieces, $25, $30, no problem. The same pieces right now are probably going for $50, $60. So it's really bought into my buying power. <laughs> let, let me. What was that website? Second one. Uh, the second one was antiquecameos.net. Yes, ma'am. Now, you said um, this has a C clasp. I believe yours had a locking C clasp. A locking C clasp. Well, it's a C. Yeah. What, is that a Edwardian, you said? Well, almost everything that we've seen has a C clasp. If it's a simple C clasp, then it's older. That will put it into the Victorian or the Georgian There's early no, Edwardian. There's no, there's no extra. I'll, I'll take a look at it for you after, afterwards. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but the more modern ones, the modern C class, the locking C class, unless you can look at it. If you look at some of the locking ones, you can see that they were not mass produced. They were custom built. So that's getting into 1909. The locking C class manufactured was patented, I believe, in 1911. So this is a very good means to help us identify at least gives us some, it's either on this side of this range or this side of this range. So it gives us a start. This has no extra lock. I'll look at it after the meeting. Yes, ma'am. You mentioned Wedgwood. Um, are they considered cameos or not? By definition, if it's raised above the surface, it's considered a cameo. In Wedgwood pieces, the white part is raised above the blue. 
Strictly speaking, no, I don't personally consider them cameos. I own some of them, but again, it's more to research them. I guess I'm just more of a purist. But uh, I have seen them advertise as cameos. By definition, they meet that requirement. They're just manufactured. They're not carved. Yeah, it's pottery. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. You mentioned quite a few of these materials that they're made out of. What's the most um, valuable? Because you mentioned whether pearl, coral, or black house? Probably the coral. Okay. And I think the coral pieces are going to become more and more valuable as global warming continues because we are starting to lose our coral beds. And it may get to the point where coral will have the same restrictions upon it as the ivory. I mean, I'm just projecting years in the future that uh, they don't want people poaching what little coral is left. So uh, I think, I, I, in my opinion right now, the coral is probably the most valuable. Some people would argue that the um, hard stones made out of the banded agate, particularly if they have more than, one, more than two layers, are more valuable. And the advantage of the hard stones is they can get that in multiple sizes, whereas, yes, you can get large hunks of coral, but it's hard to do, and they're just not as big as some of the banded agate would be. Yes, ma'am? Um, what do the volcanic chains look like? How are all of each of them? And second, um, <coughs> The volcanic material is consistent in color. There is no veining through it. It will have the appearance of rock. Unfortunately, it comes in a wide range of colors. I've seen it in taupe, beige, white, black, red. Uh, so if, if you all were going to be buying a lava cameo, I would suggest you only do it from a reputable source. Most of those that I have over there are Lucite and Bakelite. Lucite? Mm -hmm. The clear parts on them are Lucite. How are we doing on time? Oh, we still got about nine minutes. Okay, all right. Yes, ma'am. When you're done dry brushing, do you also use cloth? Yes. And I will vary that somewhat depending upon the age of the cameo and knowing what condition it was in when I first got it. If it's an older one and had obviously not received the care it needed, I might leave that sheen on there and then check back on it in a week or so. And if it hasn't absorbed the, all that mineral oil, then I'll wipe the excess off. But I probably work with and look at these far more than you, you'll probably look at them maybe four or five times a year. So unless you make a point, you might not go back and do that second wiping. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Um, when they did this back in Roman times, was it because they didn't have photography and they were trying to capture an image of someone they knew, or are these just random figures? I don't have a lot of information on that. We can surmise, we know that they did paintings, they did large sculptures, both in metal and bronze, they did, um, shoot, I can't think of the word, where they took little mosaics, things like that. So they had multiple means of producing art. This is obviously just one of the means they chose to do it. The few that I've seen uh, tend to be male, they call them senators or Caesars or something like that, but unless it's directly related to a bust of one of those people, they really can't tell. So they weren't captured? Cap cap no, they have no identification. No identification on it at all. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Uh, it seems to me that all the cameos are the profile of women. Women, because they're wearing the jewelry, but are there any that, uh, say, a woman would wear her 
betrothed or man in the cameo. It's always it the, always looks like the same woman to me. The woman yeah. started. The woman became popular basically during the Victorian period. But if you look on the top left hand, those are all landscapes. Oh, landscapes. landscapes. Um, the bottom shelf is mostly female figures. Some of them are what were called portraits. When these young men were traveling, they would have pictures or drawings, and some of them would actually commission to have a portrait cameo made off of that. Most of them, though, represent a Greek or Roman god or goddess. Uh, if you look top right, I have quite a few male figures up there. I have boxes and boxes of male figures that are of no value because they're damaged. Yes, ma'am. Are there still do this? Yes, actually, they still have wonderful carvers in, in Italy. Um, unfortunately, many of them are producing lower quality products. But uh, in these books, they mention multiple artists, and the pictures are unbelievable what they're producing. It's, it's nothing like this. It's more flowing, stronger lines. They're not in an oval shape. That they just, they're independent pieces. But yeah, they're doing some phenomenal work right now. Are there Chinese cameos? Yes, there are. Um, I didn't bring it, but I have a, a cowrie shell that is a uh, Japanese, no, I'm sorry, it is Chinese, it's a Japanese landscape, and I was lucky enough to find, there's that, um, that old thing, it had two pictures in it, when you look through it, it put it together. Okay, I found that was the landscape that was on the cowrie shell. So I was in a, able to identify the bridge, the buildings, and uh, give me the region that it came from. They're very rare. They're not, to, to be in that, usually they're more um, gods, goddesses, things like that. And they're generally not a true, what I call true cameo. They're freestanding. They're not in the oval shape. But they do exist. It's just there doesn't seem to be a lot of interest in them. So you don't see them on the market much. Yes, sir? Were any of these ever done in Chile? Not that I'm aware of. But that doesn't mean they haven't been. That just means I haven't found one yet. I'll keep looking. Any other questions? If not, thank you very much for coming.